So if you are making journal entries, adjusting entries, so what happens is so what he's asking, he's saying he's worked in the real world for a long time and he's worked in these accounting systems, right? So you, when you take this, so I'm showing it to you on a nice little PowerPoint here and he's saying in the real world, we don't really see the general ledger, the general journal, like what, what is that? Okay, so what happens is most people in your company are, um, they work in these sub-ledgers, right? So if I work in the, if I work in an accounting department, uh, we'll keep it to the simplest of examples, right? So I'm, I'm a controller in an accounting department. I have below me working an accounting manager. There's somebody who takes care of the, the payables and somebody who takes care of the billing side of things, okay? So those people, so the payable person, they receive the bills and they enter them into the system. And they enter detail. They enter, we owe money to Joe's Auto Body. We owe money to Keurig Coffee Company. We owe money to, yeah, right. We owe money to the HVAC company for the air conditioning that we use, whatever it is, okay? So they get bills. And they enter all the detail. They enter the name. I'm trying to just make this real for you. They enter the name. They enter the address. They enter the amount of the bill. They enter the date it's due. All this detail. Have we looked at any, do you, have you seen that in anything that we've talked about so far? You don't see that detail, right? Okay, that's in the subledger. So they enter all that detail. On the billing side, there's a billing, there's a person who handles the billing. So a transaction happens, and uh, so when I was in California and I was working at this movie studio, we would have to, uh, we would have tenants that would come in to rent the space to, to shoot a movie. And for their rental, they would have to pay, if it was a big movie that was coming in, like a you know, major motion picture, they would have, we would rent them air conditioning on a monthly basis. We would rent them stage managers on a monthly, you know, stage manager rates on a monthly basis. They would have their monthly rent. All these different charges that they would have for dumpsters that they would use to clean up their sets. All these different things. You know, there's a whole variety of things. The billing person would get um, the information that would have to be billed. They would enter it into the system. This is for, you know, Lemony Snickets, the series of unfortunate events. They would enter all the information under that client they would enter the, um, you know, the, uh, all the detail, okay, um, for that client's billing information. So both of these, they're doing this on a daily basis. At the end of the day, at the end of the period, whenever we decide, a weekly basis, whatever the process is, you post into your general ledger. So that's where all the detail is. The posting that goes into the general ledger is a journal entry. So on the payable side. All the information that they enter for Joe's Auto Body, let's say we owe $1,500 for Joe's Auto Body. So um, the posting into the general ledger says whenever you, they, they would choose the accounts, okay? They would say that's maintenance expense. They, you know, they, or maybe Joe's Auto Body is automatically guided into maintenance expense or something. They're not doing a lot of work there. They're just entering this detail. They don't see the, the picture behind the scenes where I've set up the accounting system to make journal entries that post to the general ledger. So when, they when I click to post it, they don't post. When I click to post, what happens is suddenly in the general ledger system, that's a third module. It goes in there and it says maintenance expense, accounts payable, right? Actually, it doesn't even give you that much detail. What's gonna end up happening, you, it will really take the total of Joe's auto body, Cure Recovery System, blah, 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 and it will post one big journal entry to credit payable, and then it will give you all the individual expenses that it goes into. If I want detail on what's in that payable account, I have to do, go into the sub-ledger and print an accounts payable detail. Okay? Yeah, Peachtree is a, yes, Peachtree and QuickBooks. These are like very commonly used, but they're very simple. What, what I'm talking about and what he's talking about are like these huge, right, these like, enterprise, re these really big enterprise systems that um, are very common in large corporations. There are like mid-range QuickBooks and Petri you can buy off the shelf. They're great, but they, they, they don't have the controls in place that these large systems would have. So they're wonderful if you're a small business. Absolutely wonderful, like, you know, for those types of things. But you could like do whatever you want and like reverse whatever you want and change. You can't do that in these systems. Right, there's a lot more controls in place. Yes. So, now, the billing person, same thing. The stuff comes over. So, into the general ledger mo module is like a big journal entry. But you can't get all the detail. You want detail, you have to go into the sub-ledger. 
So it tells you, it'll get you the total revenue into your general ledger. So now, at the end of the period, getting to the point of what I was, you know, the whole point of all this. So at the end of the period, you have to make adjustments. So let's say um, payroll comes in. Payroll is a, real, a really easy one, I think. So payroll comes in, and normally the person who does the payables will enter, say, that payroll entry. Okay, will enter the payroll, say, through the accounts payable system. Okay, whatever. The payroll comes in. But it's not coming in until three days after, five days after the end of the period. Okay, so there's two days of payroll. So let's say payroll is seven hundred dollars. It's a dollar a day, a hundred dollars a day, and it's not going to come in until five days after the end of the period. So what's your payroll expense for the first two days that you haven't that's been that's been incurred but hasn't been recorded? Two hundred dollars, right? So what happens is I don't I say to my payroll person. I, I mean I say, I don't say to my accounts payable person. You're going to need to make an adjusting entry, and then we're going to have to revert, do all these things. I don't involve them. They have, a, they have a, a process that they do. Okay, I go in, and I say, okay, into the general ledger system itself, where nothing really happens. Everything actually really happens in these sub-ledgers and just post into the general ledger. Right? That's where all the, the, all the real details and everything that's happening is happening in these sub-ledgers. Nobody touches the general ledger unless you're like, at a higher level of understanding about how everything works. Right? Right, 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 for, right, right, exactly. Because here you're bypassing all the controls. So if I want to make this $200 entry, I make it directly into the general ledger. I debit payroll expense for $200. I debit accrued payroll by $200 on the, at the 31st. At the first, the, you know, at the same time, I make a general, general entry for the next day. That reverses it. Because then when payroll comes in, they just do whatever they normally do. And what it did by reversing it, it nets the payroll expense to $500. See what I'm saying? So you had, you, I debited payroll expense and accrued payroll on the 31st, and I debited payroll and credited expense on the 1st for 200 yes. Now when they do what they normally do, they're gonna, how much are they going to debit expense for? 700 and the net effect is going to be $500. That's a reversing entry, and that's why they're done. Okay? That's why they're done in the normal course of business, because... Um, you don't want to. You don't necessarily need to involve everybody and say, "Well, you need to go and like know that I accrued two hundred dollars of that payroll." So you don't need to do. You only make a journal entry for five hundred. That can be very confusing because there are lots of different people with lots of different roles. So I hope that answers your question about how the general ledger sort of fits in. And so that's that's like the big picture with the, the adjusting entries that we were talking about last week. Right, but really that's not done. Like if you use Peachtree or you use QuickBooks, then your general journal is an important thing because it's not this controlled thing that has different modules. A lot of stuff is then entered into the general ledger or you could do it that way. You could use, they have modules, but they're just not that sophisticated. That's exact, and that's exactly like payroll. That's exactly the same example that I gave with the payroll, exactly like that, right? And so that's very common. And actually, when you do it in, in later on this, in these environments, you're entering in the journal and you're marking as a reversal. It's going to reverse all that. Right, right, exactly, right. A lot of these systems allow you to do that. So, um, so just moving on from the adjusting entries. Now that you've done all this, now you have um, you can report, create financial reports that are hopefully accurate because they include all of your adjusting entries. So income statement is the one we're starting off with. Just, I'm just showing you. I'm going to show you all these different ones. So we have the income statement. And the income statement includes revenues and expenses, which I shouldn't have put this here. I should have made you tell me that these are not permanent accounts. They are temporary accounts. And that means what? They get closed out to income summary at the end of the year. Right. So at the beginning of the year, before at the, you come in on January 1st, should your revenue and expense accounts have any balance in them yet? If you come in like, you know, right in the morning before any business has happened, right, they should have zero balance. Okay? So here, you report on your income statement. Um, this is called a multiple step income statement. We're going to talk about multiple step versus single step when we get into uh, 
income statement, that chapter, chapter four. But here is a multiple step income statement. It shows sales minus cost of goods sold. So you have a subtotal here at gross profit. You separate out your operating expenses from your non-operating expenses to come up with net income. You don't need to worry about the details here for now. I'm just showing you this is a financial statement, an income statement, and it happens to be a multiple step income statement. Okay? Um, versus single step, which we can call the simple step. Okay? Um, income statement, oh. <laughs> I love it. I'm like, wait, I thought we were doing balance sheet. I, how many times am I going to do that every class, okay? All right, so balance is so bizarre. So balance sheet. Um, here's your accounting equation. So your accounting equation, assets equal liabilities plus owner's equity, is a balance sheet. Those are all of the accounts that comprise the balance sheet, okay? Where does your income statement, your net income number, close out into? Right. Huh? Yes, you, it just goes into it. If you have a net income, then your net your retained earnings will go up. If you have a net loss, your retained earnings will go down. So let's just think about this logically. I want to make sure this is clear to everybody. So you have a trial balance. A trial balance, the debits and the credits have to be the... They have to be the same, right? They have to be equal, okay? So included in the trial balance, you have all of your accounts... Every one of them. Assets, liabilities, equity, revenue, expenses. So in order to balance, you have to have all of your accounts right, listed. In order for your debits to equal your credits. So on a balance sheet, a balance sheet has to balance. It's like a, it's like an, it's, it's taking all the trial balance information. It needs to be equal. So if you have an income statement, that's taking part of the stuff from the trial balance and putting it on one statement. That doesn't have to balance. That just has to be a net income or net loss, right? But when you go through the balance sheet, you have to incorporate every single account that you had on your trial balance. Otherwise, you're not going to balance, right? So here, on our balance sheet, we have assets, we have liabilities, and we have equity. But we need to incorporate those revenues and those expenses in order to balance. So just, just trying to make this make sense to everybody. That, that goes into retained earnings. That's the net income number going into retained earnings is the way of incorporating all of the rest of the accounts on the trial balance. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Because I think, I'm just trying to think back to like when I was doing accounting for the first time. These are like little things that would throw me off. So I'm just trying to clarify all of that for you guys. Okay. So again, your, your, your trial balance, your, your, your balance sheet is going to incorporate all of that information from your trial balance. So it only has that you can see in, in detail assets, liabilities, and equity, but the retained earnings incorporates all that rest of that stuff into it. Okay? And then there's another piece we're going to learn about. It's not on here right now. Well, dividends come out of retained earnings. That's a very important point. But another really important thing we, we're going to learn about later is something called comprehensive income, other comprehensive income. So you can see that also in here. You may want to note you can also have something called other comprehensive income, which may incorporate some of the things that look like they belong on the income statement, but they bypass the income statement. So you haven't learned about that yet, but you might want to note you can have other comprehensive income or accumulated other comprehensive income in here. Question? Yes? This, okay, that's a really good question. This is not debit versus credit. This is like, this is all, this is just a total. Like, so this is 21,000. Now, 300 minus 20 gives you 280. So what they're doing is here, they're just subtotaling things. I'm really glad you asked that. Okay, because I don't want that, I, don't, I want that to make sure that's clear. There, there's no, like, this is not debit and credit, and I can see absolutely why you'd think that. This is a way of presenting a balance sheet when you have things, so accounts receivable less the allowance for uncollectible gives you your net accounts receivable balance. So a lot of balance sheets will be presented this way. So another question that may come up for you guys is, well, you may see um, trial balance, I mean, you may see balance sheets that don't do it like that. There's not like a, you know, not every, there is a standard, there's like a somewhat standard format, but pe people do things differently. You're going to see as we go through, I'm not going to be like a stickler for you have to do it exactly this way, otherwise it's wrong. You know, some people show things just net of tax. Some people will show this minus the tax effect and then show the balance. It just depends upon, you know, they could just as easily have said accounts receivable comma net 280. See what I mean? 
It just depends upon how they choose to present it. Okay? So, um, but that's a really good question. I'm glad you, glad you asked that. All right, so we have the income statement. We have the balance sheet. Can anyone think of another important statement that we used? Cash flows. Statement of cash flows, right. So the statement of cash flows has three different sections, okay? Operating, investing, and financing. And we're going to get into detail in this in another chapter. But those are three different sections. OIF, those are the sections in the statement of cash flows. Um, what I want to mention here, so this reconciles to your year-end cash balance. And what's really important about the statement of cash flows, because this is the one that people go, what is this? Like, what are we doing? This is so confusing. It doesn't make any sense. What is all this nonsense, okay? So I just want to talk about it just for a moment. So you have this income statement on the accrual basis. It tells you what you've earned, what, ex what revenue you've earned, what expenses you've incurred. Did it mean you received any cash? No, it doesn't mean you received anything. And you have your balance sheet, which tells you kind of assets you have on hand, it tells you what people owe you, what your receivables are. It tells you what debt you have, what you have to pay, right? It tells you what you've earned cumulatively to date in your retained earnings account. Does that help you pay your bills? Is that going to pay your utility bill? Anything on there? No. What do you need to actually operate a business? Cash. You need to know how much cash you have coming in because without cash, you have nothing. Okay, you can't pay your bills, you can't invest in your company to expand, you can't, you can't operate. You just simply cannot operate. Think about those moments where you look at your bank account and you go, holy cow, I have 50 bucks and I have $1,000 in bills. Okay? This happened, happened to me last week, okay? Before I started working, I, well, I, you know, I was like, well, this is a little bit of a problem. Okay? You can't operate when you don't have cash. Okay? So the statement of cash flows even though it seems like this bizarre thing that you have to put together and we're going to help make sense of it and make it not so scary, okay? it is hugely important because it tells you how you've used your cash during the period, what cash has come in and what cash you've used. Bless you. Which in conjunction with the other statements is extremely important. Right? It just intuitively, right? It makes sense. We all agree. You need cash. And none of the other statements are necessarily telling you how, your ca how much cash you have coming in, how much cash you have coming out. Okay? So this is reconciling to your cash balance okay? um, and telling you about the cash you've used in your operations, the cash you've used in investing, and the cash you've used in financing or brought in in any of those ways. Okay? Because also, on top of, I'll just mention this one, one other thing, on top of the fact that you have cash, maybe you may have a lot of cash coming in, what if you have a lot of cash coming in because you took out a loan or because you had the, a gain on some sale of property that you sold? Is that a good kind of cash to have? Not, not in the long run, right? Because if you can't bring in cash from your operations, if you're bringing them in because you sold some investments or because you were financing on something, on something that doesn't bode well, but you, you're not bringing in any, anything in from here. In the long run, you're not probably going to survive. And on the flip side of that, if you look at the statement of cash flows and you look at how much, how much cash they're bringing in for financing, it could be an indication to an investor that this is a company that's trying to expand or invest in their company by taking out loans, right? So it's not, there's not a universal meaning to, when you, to what everything, everything that you see on the statement of cash flows, but there is very important information there, right? I'm thinking of investing in this company. Let me look and see financing wise are they bringing in a lot of money because they've heard that they're you know if they're talking about expansion are they backing it up are they taking out money so that they can do that and investing in the future okay so these are the kinds of things and why the statement of cash flows is so important and we will go over this in more detail in a future chapter okay um, so then we have the statement of stockholders equity this is the roll forward of your equity okay so you have your equity at the beginning, you add in income minus dividends, add in any issuance of new common stock, that should give you what your equity balance is at the end of the year. Okay, equity meaning, this is more than one account, this is like the equity section. Right? If I, if I take away the issuance of common stock and I just say 
So something at 1, 1 that I have to add net income to and take out dividends, that's right. You got it. Okay? If I took out the issuance of common stock, we're talking about a roll forward of retained earnings, which would be a statement of retained earnings. Okay? Any questions? Okay. So we'll keep going. So we make, we, yes? Equity at 1 1, equity at January 1st. Okay? Then equity at 1231 is at the end of the year. Okay? So basically, equity is equal to return earnings lost on the stock? Yeah, I mean, here, this is your, your stockholders' equity section. So, like this 601, right, is made up of retained earnings and common stock. So, to roll it forward for the year, you need to incorporate whatever is in that, those accounts. Okay? Um, so next, so now we've created these, we've, we, have this, we have this adjusted trial balance, we make our financial statements. So now we have to close our books for the year. So we're going to go through the closing process. So the first thing you have to do is close out all your temporary accounts. Okay, your re revenues, your expenses, and your dividends have to be closed out. Next, you, your income statement accounts, well, where, how do you close them out? That's important. You, these are your income statement accounts. You close them to the income summary. All your income statement accounts get closed into income summary. Now, just again, bringing a little bit of a real, real world flavor into this. I'm going to make you in a few minutes do some closing entries. But I'm telling you that your accounting system will close these out and you will never make these journal entries. But, you, it, but it is still important that you understand what it's doing behind the scenes. Okay? So like, if you were to look at a retained earnings balance um, in, a, in a sophisticated accounting system and like click into get the detail on that retained earnings balance, you're not going to see sales revenue, you know, interest revenue, cost of goods sold, da 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 You're going to see one number. And why are you going to see that one number? Because you close it to income summary, and then it just that goes into the retained earnings. Is this, is this on the, notes? the slides are posted on Blackboard, but there are some things that I've removed from the slides to encourage you to write and take notes. This is my new thing here, so um, I want people to write because I have noticed as the semesters go on, people just kind of sit there because they're like, oh, the slides are up on Blackboard, so they don't do anything. So I want you to write because I think it'll help you to learn. Okay, so listen, write, what I mean, you know, whatever works. Yes? Well, I posted them at like 1.30 this afternoon. That wasn't early enough? No? All right. Okay. All right. If I, as long as I remember, if you don't see them up and you're looking for them the night before, just send me an email. Okay. I have two little kids, so I like am running around with them, and all of a sudden it's the next day, you know. It's like all of a sudden it's the next year, you know. So <laughs> that's that's my life. So I'm I can I can surely do that. I just you have to just if I haven't done it, just remind me. Like at one o'clock this afternoon, I went to do it, and then I was like, take it, and then I was like, did I even do it? I couldn't remember, and then I had to go back, you know. So things just happen. So so I, I that's no problem. All right, so let's keep going. Um, next, so the balance and income summary should therefore be equal to what's in net income, right? That makes sense. If you're closing all those accounts out, the revenue and expense accounts, that should be equal to what your net income is. That goes into income summary ultimately. Dividends. Oh, income summary is closed to retained earnings, right? We understand that. Dividends close directly into retained earnings, not into income summary. And then, once you close all these temporary accounts, you have what's called the post-closing trial balance. What is missing, and we talked about this last class, but that was already a week ago, so I'll, I'll ask you again. So what is missing from a post-closing trial balance? The income and expense accounts. It, it ends at retained earnings, right? Or, or other comprehensive income. No, it ends at the bottom of the balance sheet. Because you've closed all those accounts out into retained earnings. 
So it ends at the bottom of the equity. Your balance, your trial balance. But it still balances because all the revenue and expense accounts have closed into them. So I have some journal entries here we would make. So when you close income summary, when you close your revenues and expenses into income summary, so expenses normally have what kind of balance? Debit or credit? Debit. Debit. So when you close them out to zero, what do you have to do? Credit, credit them, which means the other side of the entry is income summary. So income summary now has a debit balance, which represents the expenses. That makes sense, because that's where expen expenses normally have a debit balance. Revenues normally have what kind of balance? Credit balance. So to close them to zero, you have to debit them. Credit income summary. So now income summary has a big credit for revenues and a big debit for expenses. That would give you your net income or loss. Income summary closes out to retained earnings. This assumes, this journal entry assumes that income summary is containing net income and not a loss. If it was a loss, then you would be right. It would be reversed, exactly. That makes sense? Okay. So let's look at, I have exercise, uh, exercise 314. Exercise 314. You're going to just make some entries. Um, exercise 314, you're going to close out some, uh, some stuff to the income summary. So going over this. So you have to do, so just to be clear, when you close things out to the income summary, there's three journal entries that you'll have to make. One related to all the revenues, and, and these, and I understand that this is not something that you might intuitively know, right? These are not expenses, they're contra revenue accounts. It's like accounts receivable has an allowance for doubtful accounts. Those are contra to that specific account. So on a trial balance, your sales returns would probably be up with the revenue accounts, not with the expenses, okay? So you have one entry for your, so if, if revenue has a credit balance, you have to debit it to bring it to zero. If sales discounts and sales returns, they actually have debit balances. They go in the opposite direction as a sales, right? If you have a sales return, you have to reduce your sales. That's what these accounts do. So they have debit balances, so you have to credit them to bring them to zero. The balance, to balance that journal entry, you, you credit income summary for 319000 So I would always start off with what you know. You know you have certain balances. I, you need to make them zero. So do the opposite to make them zero. What do you have left? That is, becomes what your balancing entry is, the income summary. On the other side, you have expenses, which normally have a debit balance. So to credit, you have to credit them individually. This is where I want you to try to think about the real world here to make sense of this, OK? If you have accounts with a balance, you can't add them all up and then just make a credit to expense. Is that going to reduce any specific account down to zero? No. It's going to just. I don't even know what you're going to, you know, it's just going to, it's going to maybe in total make the expense, if you were to make an income statement, it would make your total expenses zero, but you'd have a lot of detail and then you'd have some random credit and then the balance would be zero. You need to make each of those individual account balances zero, okay? So here is where we're doing that. We're taking each individual account balance and making it zero and closing it to income summary. And now... You look at your 319 minus your 302. You add, that gives you a credited income summary of three of 17,000. So to make income summary close out, you have to debit it now for 17,000 and put it into retained earnings. Yes. Yeah, what, so you, you put in, so what I would, how I would start this off, I would not start, I would start off not with this number. I would start off with the credits and add them up and see what they add up to, and then I would make the debit entry. 
So I understand what you're saying. You don't know it's 302. So great news flash, right? Do you have de they have the debit and credit? Doesn't mean that you have to know the debit before the credit. It doesn't mean you have to know this is 319. You put in what you know, and then you have to balance. So to balance, this is what you do. Okay. I'm, gl I'm glad you asked that because these are the kinds of things you'll come across. A lot of times, as you become comfortable with accounting and you can make journal entries for everything and under kind of understand what you're doing, you'll have many situations where you'll know you have to get to a certain spot and it requires you to put in what you know and then figure out what the balancing piece is. You know the right account, you just don't know the right amount. <clears throat> so next, what I'd like you guys to do, yeah, oh, one more question. No, it's okay. Don't apologize. This is what, if you have a question, other people, I'm sure, have a question as well. I'm a little confused where you got the 17,000. Okay, so the 17,000. The 17,000. Here in income summary, any, is everyone seeing where the 319 comes from? It's just a balancing entry. So now, after this entry, income summary has a credit balance of 319. You've made a journal entry into that account for 319 credit. The next one, you've now made a debit entry into that account for 302. So if you were to make a T account with a credit of 319 and a debit of 302, what is your balancing entry? What is your balance? $17,000 credit. So the next thing you have to do is make that account zero. You have to now close that account. So to close an account that has a $17,000 credit, you have to debit it for $17,000. And so the balance goes into retained earnings. So this tells us we had net income of 17000 Okay? So that's the thing. Journal entries tell a story. You can always tell, well, unless someone goes nuts and is, I mean, actually, a lot of times that happens is, journal entries are a story about what happened in your business. Okay? So the story here is, ultimately, the story here is that I had net income of $17,000. You can tell by these entries, if you were an experienced person going into a business and you see these entries, you would say, they're, they must be doing a close. They must be closing out because I see they're using the income summary account. They must be doing a close and I see that net, they have a net income of 17000 for the period that they're closing. So that's a story that you're, that's, that's being told. Okay, so Sales revenue, what happens in businesses a lot of times, and I'm sure you've all been there, right? You go to Best Buy, you buy yourself a, I don't know, an iPad or something, because don't they sell those now? You buy yourself an iPad, <laughs> and then, um, you know, you're like, it doesn't do everything I wanted it to do. <laughs> or whatever, you're going to return it, okay? So they recorded that. What, how much the iPads cost? Like 500 bucks or something? So you, so, what is it? 700. 700? Oh man, <laughs> you got a lot of memory yeah. in yours. So, so when they, when you made that purchase at Best Buy, you know they debited cash or credit card for the 500 dollars or 700, right? And they booked the sales for 500 dollars. You go back and you return it. They don't, deb they don't debit sales. They might debit sales returns for 500, credit cash for 500. So now, and then let's say they have a few other transactions. Let's say they have, let's just make one other transaction just to make something different. So also during the period, they make a sale for some television for another thousand dollars, okay? So they have sales for a thousand. So at the end of the period, rather than get into the T accounts, this would post to the ledger, right? So at the end of the period, sales has a $1,500 balance. Is that clear? Sales has a $1,500 balance. So on the trial balance, um, and cash has a thousand dollar balance. These are just two excerpts from the trial balance, okay? So you have, so you have cash of a thousand, Ba, 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 ba. You have all your assets, your liabilities, your equity. Then you have sales of what's your total sales? We said fifteen hundred total, right? Because you have a some sale for a thousand. I made up, right? So this is your put this up like a tiny bit. 
Oops, stop. Stop, wait. Oh my God. <laughs> There's a stop button in the middle. I pushed everything but that button. Okay. So, so you, have your, you have a debit here. You have your credits. <coughs> so you have sales here. And then you have right below sales, you have sales returns with a $500 balance. Okay, these are, again, just excerpts, right? And then from down below, you have, may have expenses that come below. But sales returns, like normally accounts have numbers that are associated with them. So normally the assets are like the 100 accounts. The liabilities are like the 200 accounts. The equities are the 300 accounts. The revenues are the 400 accounts. Both of these are like, you know, this might be like account 402. If sales is 400, sales returns might be like account 402. I'm making that, I mean, you know, in every business it's different, but that's, it's somewhat standard in that way that the account numbers have certain, go in this, this, in this format, okay? They may be very long account numbers where they have lots of things that they mean, okay? I'm making this very simple. So here, so you have sales, credit, and sales returns as a debit. So logically, forget anything we just did. What did you really make for the period? A thousand. You didn't make fifteen hundred. You made a thousand. That was your really what your revenue is. Okay. That's your net sales. That's exactly right. And that's what gets reported. Your net sales. So you, net sales is made up of you know sales minus sales returns minus sales discounts and things of that nature. So here, if if you had a, if, if sales has a credit balance, what do you have to do with it to make it zero? You have to debit it. So there is we're debiting sales. If Sales returns has a debit of 500. What do you have to do to make it zero? And that's what we're doing. That's all we're doing here. And then the balance goes to income summary. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes. Okay, let's say if someone bought a TV and then it's a 30 day return policy and they return on the 31st day, but Best Buy takes a TV back and gives you a gift card instead, what would you uh, credit? So they have a, they, they are, they're, so they're not actually they're taking the merchandise back. So they would have to put it back into inventory. Um, um, let me, I have to think about that. So if they return and they give you a gift card. Well, cash is not impacted. Right, it's really, a, it's really like a transfer of, the, of inventory. Because I'm making this very simple, because really when you return it, it goes back into inventory. Right, so they have, right, so they have, right, 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 so they're probably debiting inventory and crediting some liability. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. See, you can walk through these things. That's the great thing about accounting. It makes a lot of sense. Nobody's out trying to trick you. Nobody's out trying to make things complicated. It's telling the story of a business, so that's right. You're debiting it back into inventory, and now you're crediting some liability that you have for in the future. Okay? Makes sense. All right. So let's look now. Um, I want you to do a couple of other uh, problems here. Just a little piece. I want you to um, look at a, a P32, letter B. Problem 32, letter B. I just want you to produce a very simple income statement, statement of retained earnings, and a balance sheet. P, problem 3-2. So I guess I can put that up. Just one second here. Okay. So, I want to point out here, actually, before I switch to, before I switch to the answer, I want to point out, again, these are some really important fundamentals that you have to know to be able to succeed in where we go from here. So that's one of the reasons I started with this chapter. I'm spending so much time on this chapter. If you find yourself not getting confused on some of the fundamentals, this is what you need to spend time on now because otherwise, don't jump ahead because you're going to have a lot of trouble jump going ahead without understanding the basics, okay? So let's talk about some of the basics that are really important to get when you see a trial balance, okay? First of all, you want to know your trial balance balances. You can't see that from here, but if you have it in front of you, you want to know your trial balance should always balance, okay? That's fundamentally very important. Now, a trial balance should always go in order, in this order. You should write this down if you, even if you think you would know it. Assets, liabilities, 
equity, revenues, expenses. Okay? Assets, liabilities, equity, revenue, expenses. So you should never pull out an account from here. You should never say, oh, I think equipment might be a revenue account. If this is a proper trial balance, if it's a proper trial balance, then you will never be pulling things from one area and putting them in another area. What did I say the accounting equation is, is equivalent to? Which financial statement? The balance sheet. So if this goes in order of assets, liabilities, and equity, then you know that all of these items make up your balance sheet. And this, these are your balance sheet accounts. But what do we know we need to incorporate into the balance sheet also? Retained earnings has to be adjusted, right, to incorporate that net income, otherwise your balance sheet won't balance. But fundamentally, you have to know assets, liabilities, equity. And if, it's not, if these accounts are not familiar to you, you wouldn't know that you know, cash or receivables or supplies is an asset. These are things you fundamentally need to know in order to be successful in the rest of this course. I'm just telling you, you got to study that if that's not comfortable for you. And I'm not saying you have to be an expert at it at this point. You have to be aware of at least some of these basics. Okay? So if you're not, this is where you need to spend your time during the week. It's worth spending the time if you want to do well in the class. Right? You need to understand some of these fundamentals. Now, so you have assets, liabilities, equity, revenues, and expenses. So that tells you that what, what, what's down here? What, is, what financial statement is this going to be? Income statement, right? So for the income statement, it's all of these accounts. Okay? So I would start off, you need to start off with the income statement to come up with a net income number. Now that you have net income, then you can go to what? Retained earnings. So you can roll forward your retained earnings so that you know what retained earnings number is going to go where? On your balance sheet. Get it? Okay. So here, oops, this is not the slides. <laughs> So slides, let's look at the slides here. I have the solution up. Okay, so here's your income statement. All we did is take the revenues minus the expenses that were there and we come up with 36,450. Are there any questions on where I came up with these numbers? Okay, this is just the bottom part of that trial balance. From there, now the 36,450 can go to our statement of retained earnings. We had beginning retained earnings of 3,500. Add in your net income of 36,450. Ending retained earnings is 39,950. I was very pleased to see a lot of you had these numbers. Okay, yes. These slides are. This, this, this is a solution to the problem. It's not on Wiley Plus. Okay, so you should write this down. And we're going to take a break after this, so I can always leave these up if you want to look at them. Okay? Yes? These are in, yes, yeah, so this, so yeah. funny, this question came up for me yeah. in uh, the other class, right? So like the students were like, but on Wiley Plus, it has to go in, in numerical order. There is no rule that says that your, that, your, that your expenses have to go in descending order, okay? I've seen them in alphabetical order. I've seen them in descending order. I've seen them in, you know, very, you know, really you would have your operating first and then your non-operating generally, right? But there's no rule. So it's not like you always have to put the highest amount first, okay? So just be aware of that. They may mark it wrong on Wiley Plus, unfortunately. But again, this may be part of the workaround that when I finally get to talk to somebody, that they say, well, if, you know, if, if, we, if we put this onto your site, it will fix it or something. So for right now, just be aware that I would put things in descending order just to save yourself a headache. But know that that is not a steadfast rule in accounting. Exactly, yes. So. Now we have a balance sheet. So the balance sheet, very importantly, has to balance. So your assets have to equal your liabilities plus your equity. So 
you should have a $67,000 balance made up of these, this information. So the good news is if you're really excited that some of your numbers balance, that's good because you're in accounting and that's really exciting when things balance, when you're, you, know, you know you're in the right place, right? If you don't care, you should have, start thinking about what you're doing, right? Because like, you should change your major, right? Because there's like nothing more satisfying than when things, it's like, yes, yes, it worked. It's so exciting. You know, so if you're like, whatever, I like it better when it doesn't balance, then uh, you, should become an, you should become an art history major or something, or some kind of art major. <laughs> okay? So, um, so that walks us through um, our financial statements. The very last thing we're going to do with this chapter, which I'm going to give you a break, uh, we're just going to do some reversing, we're going to talk about reversing entries, which we've actually already talked about um, at the beginning of this class. And we'll just talk about converting from cash to accrual basis very briefly. But we'll, let's take a break. Um, why don't you come make sure you're back by 10 after 8. And um, we'll finish up this chapter and go into, chapter go into chapters 1 and 2. Okay? All right, guys, let's get started. Oh, wait, one more second. Here we go. So, we've now gone through transactions, journal entries, posting to the ledger, right? We've gone through um, making a trial balance. We know that we make adjusting journal entries, and then from there we have a final trial balance. We can go ahead and make our financial statements. We, we made an income statement, a balance sheet, a statement of retained earnings. Okay, and so now I just want to touch on a couple of additional items to finish up this chapter. And then that should basically take you through everything you learned the last time when you took financial accounting. So these reversing entries, we've already talked about this. So I don't want to spend too much time here. I gave you the example of salaries. And here we are back in salaries. So I'll show you this briefly. We'll do a quick exercise on it, and then we'll move on. So um, reversing entries, I say, are usually for accruals at year end or period end. So the opposite is made the first day of the next period. So I gave you that salaries example. I said if you had $700 in salaries every week for a seven-day week, you know, or for seven work days, and two days of that takes place, and then you have an end of the period. Then it becomes 1231. You have to accrue. So it was two of those days. So you would have a $200 accrual that you would re reverse. Or here I have 100 in the following period. Okay? And we, we, we now know the rationale of why you do that. Because then you go ahead and just do everything. The person who gets the payroll just makes the same journal entry as normal. Okay? But the net effect of the reversal is that it takes the expense. If they're, if they're debiting the full amount of the expense in the next period, and then you have this credit there, it nets the expense to what the appropriate amount is for that period. Okay? So, you could reverse it. There's a couple of different things you could do here. So, if you have an accrued salary for this um, $100, let's just do a quick little thing here. So, you have accrued salaries for $100, that's the number I have up here, so that's the number I'll use. So you make, you make this first journal entry, you debit salaries expense. For $100, you, cr you credit accrued salaries for $100. One option is that you reverse it, you do that. Okay? The other option is that you don't do anything. Right? So next period, payroll, let's say, is Let's just say it's $500 for the period, in total. So now you haven't said anything. You didn't, we didn't reverse that entry. So, and payroll comes in and it's $500 for the period. So what do you do? You know you have to pay the payroll, right? It, for $500. So what do you have to credit? Let's start with the easy stuff. Cash. You have to credit cash, you know, for $500. And this is how I, will, I would tell you, especially as you start off, always approach a journal entry with, with what you know first. Okay? And then you kind of can back in and figure out, it like, starts to make more sense. As you write down what you know, you can get some confidence and then you can figure out what you didn't know. Okay? So you know that you have to credit cash for $500. So what the heck do you have to debit? 
You definitely have to debit salaries expense. But for 400. Right. And how do you balance that entry? The accrued salaries are sitting out there. That's a liability. For how much? 100. So if you didn't reverse it, this would be the entry you'd have to make. If you reverse it, what, if, if, if I made this entry and then the, at, you know, at 1231, and then at 1-1 one, one of the following year, I just simply reverse it, accrued salaries and salaries expense. Okay, just doing it, writing it quickly. Now what I do when pay payroll comes in at $500? Exactly. Salaries expense would be 500 and cash 500. Really simple. You don't have to do anything special. You don't have to, you don't have to remember that you had an accrued ex expense out there, nothing. But the net effect is what's your salaries expense? 400 because here it's 500, but you made this reversing entry and that credits the expense for 100. So the net effect is salaries expense is 400, which is the exact same thing as this. Yes. Yes. Accrued expense is a liability. Okay. So why don't you try, just to make sure that you understand that and we bring that home here. Brief exercise 313. Brief exercise 313. So here, it asks you in the letter A to reverse the accrual. What happens on January 1st? So that's the beginning of the next period. So if you just misread the question, I could see that you would have set up the accrual, which would have been the opposite of that, debiting expense, crediting payable. That would have been the correct entry at 1231. The correct entry at 1-1 would be debiting payable and crediting expense. Okay, and then the subsequent entry, if you reverse it, would be just do everything as if you had done nothing at all in the prior period, just debit expense and credit cash when payroll comes in. If you didn't make the reversal, you would have had an expense and a payable out there for 40. You had a payable out there for 4,200 from your 1231 entry, December 31st. So your expense for the period for the $7,000 of payroll is actually only 2,800, and then you would have debited the $4,200 payable and credited cash. So I saw a few of you just to make sure I want to clarify. Um, when you pay something, make sure that you credit cash. Okay, because when you pay something, your bank account's going to go down. So you want to make sure that you, whenever you see paid, that cash goes up, you know, d goes down or when received, cash goes up. Pay a bull and receive a bull or when you're not actually receiving the cash. Okay? Any questions on that? Questions? All right, so just a couple more slides and we're done with this chapter and then we're going to start briefly in the next chapter. Okay? So... Cash to accrual basis um, is covered in this chapter. So this is a very, um, if you have to go from cash to accrual, on a cash basis, what are you concerned about? Only what actually is paid and what actually is received, right? What cash is changing hands. Transactions don't get recorded unless you pay something and receive or receive something. On an accrual basis, well, you're worried about what you've earned and what you've incurred. So if you're changing from cash to accrual, you have to figure out where I, transactions that have happened where you've earned revenue but you haven't received cash. Or when you owe something but you haven't paid it yet. So what happens is many companies, particularly smaller companies, run on a cash basis month to month. And then when they need to report to people at the end of the period, they make accruals and then they reverse them and then they go back to cash basis for the next month and then they accrue things at the end of the following month that's the reality of how a lot of businesses work okay they're only worried think about that logically right you have people working in the payables department who are paying bills and they record it when they pay it they put stuff into the payable system and they immediately pay it the day that they're gonna pay stuff right and you're not posting it up they're just paying stuff you have People who are not, not, if there's no sophisticated billing system, they're not billing necessarily, they're just, they have customers who pay them and that's it. And at the end of the period, they figure out what, who do we have, you know, give services to, 
Maybe they make up their invoices on Excel. Maybe they have invoices that they give out, but they don't go through the accounting system. So they have to go through the bills and say, well, who do we bill that didn't pay us yet? That puts us on, and we'll, let, let's record those as receivables. Okay? So that's the reality of how a lot of businesses actually run. Okay? Particularly smaller businesses. They only go on the accrual basis when they need to do their month end reporting or their period end reporting or they have someone to report to. Okay? Um, and, and we talked about subsidiary ledgers. You know, these are these sub ledgers where you have, just think of them as like someone sitting at a computer somewhere entering things in detail. Okay? Um, and that takes us through chapter three. That's our first chapter done.